If you would please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. The Olympics are happening uh, right now in Japan. And Olympic gymnastics is one of the events that a lot of people like to tune in to watch. A lot of people like to watch gymnastics. In gymnastics, though, there is no grace for the, the participants, for the athletes. They must be perfect. If they're one step out of line, deductions off their score, and they can't win. Uh, Brianna and I were watching some of the vaults. Some of the athletes do their vaults. They run down the lane, they jump on the springboard, they plant their hands upon the, the table, they flip through the air, and they must land within a small, thin area. They've got one foot to the left, one foot to the right, and if they're not within that area, big points come off, and they likely won't win the event. When they land, they have to stick the landing with their feet right in the center. No stepping forward, no stepping back, but a solid, firm landing with both feet. If they have one, even a tiny step out of line, deductions and chances that they won't win. Thank the Lord that we are not under such a rigid and strict government from our God. Our God has grace and mercy with us when we take steps in the wrong direction. Today we're going to see that even the Apostle Peter stepped away from the gospel. For a moment, he got out of step with the message that he preached, but by God's grace and mercy, we'll see the apostle Peter come back into fellowship with his brothers. They corrected him, he repented, and God was gracious to him. Uh, the Olympic gymnasts get no grace. They must be perfect. But we have a God who loves us and accepts us and shows us grace, if indeed we trust in Christ. In our message today, we're going to learn this. Keep in step with the gospel. Keep in step with the gospel. We'll see that Peter acted contrary to the gospel. And next, we'll see that Peter's actions had consequences. And finally, we'll see that Peter was corrected by Paul and came back to the fellowship. The goal of our message today is to learn that no matter who we are, we are not Above the gospel. No one is above the gospel, but all are under submission to it, even Peter. Let's read Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. Uh, if you're ready to hear the word of the Lord, say amen. amen. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Let's pray together this morning, having heard the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We ask, Lord, that you help us keep in step with this wonderful good news that we call the gospel. Help us to be faithful to you and to your gospel. Help us to understand your word this morning. Help us to apply it to our lives. Oh, Lord, we honor you this morning. We worship you and praise you, and we strive as best we can to keep in step with your gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn now, everyone, to the first couple of verses in our text. In these two verses, we'll see that Peter acted contrary to the gospel. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Peter acted contrary to the gospel. The gospel. Today in our text, Galatians 2, 11 through 14, we find Peter and Paul both in Antioch. If you remember last week, Peter, uh, not Peter, Paul traveled down to Jerusalem to have a meeting with some of the apostles, a private meeting. God sent him down to Jerusalem to get a confirmation of his gospel. 
He goes down to Jerusalem. He meets with Peter and James and John. And they hear Paul's message that he's preaching. And they say, yes, this is the gospel that we preach as well. Go now. Teach this to the Gentiles. Show everyone that if you simply have faith in Christ, then you may be saved. Whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised, Paul, take this to everyone and share it with them all. Peter confirms to Paul that his gospel is the true gospel, the one that comes from God. Theologically, Peter knew and affirmed the true gospel. In his mind, he knew that the gospel was for everyone. He knew it was for Jews, he knew it was for Greeks, he knew it was for Gentiles, he knew it was for Everyone. But then, shortly after affirming the true gospel, Peter did something that seems to contradict his beliefs. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 again and see what Peter did to contradict what he teaches. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is another name for Peter. When Peter, the apostle, came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. At first, we see Paul's actions were completely in accord with the message that he taught. He knew, Peter knew, that nothing was unclean for the one who was in Christ. He had been to Cornelius' house, a Roman centurion who definitely was not Jewish. <laughs> Probably very, very unlikely that he was circumcised or ate clean food. Peter went into his house, spent time with him, spent time with his family, shared the gospel with him, and, and touched their whole family as he baptized them and brought them up. Peter at first acted in step with the gospel. He came to Antioch. He, he spent time with the Gentiles, eating meals with them even. That's an intimate setting, right? To step into someone's home, to, to recline at the table with them. They recline, we sit. Same, same concept. We're at the table with someone, eating with them. That's, that's intimate. That's something friends do. That's something people that, that like each other do. At first, he did the right thing. Peter treated them like friends and brothers. But then, Peter started to fear what the Jews might think if they saw him spending time with Gentiles. We're told that certain brothers came from James. Uh, they came and... When they came, everything changed for Peter. Uh, James, the James we're talking about here, is James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus' half-brother, James. He was a leader in the Jerusalem church. Uh, he, was, he was one of the head haunches there. He's called an apostle in Scripture. So at some point, God appointed him as an apostle. And he was a key leader in the church of Jerusalem. So brothers come from Jerusalem. And they come and they, they find Peter in Antioch. And when they find him there, they see him doing something they've never done in their lives. They see him eating with Gentiles. Eating with Gentiles. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Maybe they said something like this to Peter. Maybe they said, Peter, are you really eating with these people that are unclean? We're, we're Jews. We've separated ourselves from unclean Gentiles our entire lives, and you're eating with them? Maybe they said, said to Peter, Peter, aren't you supposed to be an apostle to the Jews? Didn't God send you with a special message to God's people? Isn't that what you're supposed to focus on? If the Jews see you eating with Gentiles, what will they think? How will they listen to your gospel? How will they take you as credible? No, they'll think, Peter, that you're just like them, that you're unclean as well, and you eat with unclean people. Peter, you're going to damage your ministry if you eat with people that are unclean, that are different than you are. It is true. We just read in, in the beginning of Galatians 2 that Peter was sent by God as an apostle to the Jews. And as, as Paul himself would say, uh, we need to do everything, make ourselves uh, into whatever we need to make ourselves into if the gospel might be shared with the people that we're going to. If you're, if you're speaking to Jews, then, then become like a Jew so that you might win over some toward Christ. And so Peter hears this message. He fears the, the people in his area that are Jewish, those of the circumcision party. And he starts to withdraw from the Gentiles, the ones that God had sent him to as well. Peter became afraid, and he withdrew. 
The problem with this is, is that Peter is sending a clear message to all the people in Antioch and all the people in Galatia and all the people around the world when he withdraws. Here's what Peter is saying to them. Peter's saying Gentiles are unclean. Good Christians, good Jews shouldn't eat with Gentiles. If Gentiles want to be included in the Christian family, if they want to come have a meal with me, Peter, a good Jew, then they're going to have to change themselves first. I'm not going to go to them. They've got to come to me. They better eat the right food. They better celebrate the right holidays. They better get circumcised if they want to eat food with us. Oh, brothers and sisters, Paul did not like to see that. <laughs> Paul sees what Peter is doing, and Paul knows that this is contrary to the gospel. Paul knows that all Christians are equal under the gospel. Paul will go on to say that under the gospel, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there's no slave person or free person, there's no male or female, but all people are one, united, unified in Christ. No one is better than anyone else in the family of God. We're all God's children. We're all servants of Christ. We're all at the same level, whether you're Jew or Greek. Slave or free, pastor or not pastor, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Peter should not have seen himself as better than these Gentiles and should have stayed consistent with the message that he preached, that the gospel was for everyone, but he did not. Paul says that when Peter withdrew from the Greeks, that his actions were contrary to the truth of the gospel. And because of this, Peter stands guilty before God. Look at verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Paul says that Peter stood condemned before God. Now, a little bit ago in, in chapter 1, Paul uses very harsh language to refer to people who preach a false gospel. He talks about false teachers and says these people are anathema. That means they're underneath God's divine wrath. He uses extremely harsh language. However, in chapter 2, he uses very different language when referring to Peter. Uh, the Greek words here are not nearly as harsh as when he's talking about false teachers. What Paul is trying to say here is that Peter is out of step, but he's not falling off. He's not falling off the trail. He's a bit out of step, but he's not falling off the trail. Paul is saying that Peter is doing the wrong thing, and his wrong actions find him contrary to God's commands. Though Peter is in the wrong, the language here is not saying that he is outside of the Christian faith like the false teachers are in chapter 1. He is condemned before God, uh, with that word condemned not necessarily meaning that he's fallen outside of the Christian faith. Paul sees what Peter is doing. And Paul knows that this is contrary to the gospel. Peter separated himself from people that weren't like him, and he suffered the consequences. How about us? Mount Carmel Baptist Church, how do we see those people that are around us? Do we see all Christians, all brothers and sisters as being equal no matter who they are? What if someone came into our church and did things very differently from the way that we do them? What if we had someone come from another country and join our church? And in this country, they worship God a little bit differently. While we're singing, they are also singing, but they're singing exuberantly. They're bouncing around in their feet, clapping, jumping, raising their hands, because in their culture, that's how they praise the Lord. What if someone praised the Lord like that? What if they were different from us in how they worship and what they look like while they worship? With exuberant hand swings, dancing even. Or what about someone who comes to our church and looks and dresses very differently than us? What if someone comes in and they have tattered clothing falling off of them, rather than dressing in some of their nicest clothing? Would we welcome that person? Or even more noticeably, what if someone came into the church that, that had tattoos and piercings all over their face and body and arms? That looks very different than most of us who are here this morning. 
Would we welcome them? Would we invite them out to lunch? If they were a believer, would we accept them into our fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ with open arms? Mount Carmel Baptist Church, I don't bring this up because we haven't done a good job of this. In fact, I want to commend you and how welcoming you have been. Uh, first, to me and Brianna, we have felt welcomed. And every single time I, I have seen someone new come into the church, you have welcomed them well. I've seen so many people, Greg and Pam are great at this. Many of you are great at this. Anytime someone comes into the church, I've seen so many people walk up to them, welcome them, talk with them, shake their hands. So I want to commend you, <coughs> commend you all as a church. I bring this up not because we haven't done well, but because we need to keep doing well at this. We're about to start our Gospel to Every Home initiative. We're going to go to every single house within a certain radius on our church, and we're going to share the gospel. God's gospel is powerful. Romans 1 says that the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. We're going to share with people that, that they have sinned against the Lord, but Jesus Christ paid the price, died for their sins, and then rose again to new life. By God's grace, many people in our area will hear this message, and they'll believe, and they'll come join us. And when they join with us in fellowship, we must be ready to welcome them no matter who they are or what they look like. Many, many people, most people in our area are, are good, upstanding people, <laughs> right? But we also have some people in our community, I'm sure, that are rough people. Yeah? There must be some people in our community within this radius that are addicted to drugs that use foul language and are, are rough and brusque in what they say. Those people, if they repent, or if they have repented already and want to join us in our fellowship, we must welcome them. For all of us are equally under the gospel of Christ. No one is higher than any other, just as Peter should not have seen himself as higher than the Gentiles because they come from different cultures and have a different grandfather. <laughs> Mount Carmel Baptist Church, let's get ourselves ready. Let's first go and share the gospel with everyone in our area, and then let's welcome any and everyone who hears that gospel. We have, you all have, we have done such a good job welcoming people so far. Let's continue to welcome them with open arms. So we've seen that Peter acted contrary to what he believed. In the next verse, verse 13, we're going to learn this. Peter's actions had consequences. Peter's actions had consequences. We're going to see that Peter separated himself from Gentiles and contradicted his own gospel. And because of this, because of what he did as an apostle, as a, a visible member of the church community, many other people copied him and did what he did. Look at verse 13, Galatians 2.13. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Peter's actions had consequences. Since Peter withdrew from the Gentiles, so did the rest of the Jews, following his example. They said, if Peter avoids unclean people, then I should probably do the same. Even Barnabas, who was with Paul in his ministry to the Gentiles, eating with them regularly, sharing Food and meals and intimate times of friendship and fellowship with them. Even Barnabas was led astray, following Peter's example. Why was it that everyone was led astray so easily? Well, Peter was an influential leader among the Christians. Of course he was. He was one of Jesus' closest followers, wasn't he? And he was known as a leader among the apostles. When people see their leaders doing something, they're going to want to imitate that person. Parents, we see this every day, don't we? <laughs> Parents who have, who have young kids or who have had young kids, kids want to do things just like their parents. They look up to dad and they say, oh, dad, dad ties his shoes that way. I'm going to try to tie my shoes just like dad does. They see dad sitting in the recliner and, and when dad's gone from work for the day, they climb into the recliner and sit there so they can be just like dad, just like mom. When I was a kid... Uh, when I went to elementary school, I tried to do the same thing. 
All the boys in my school left their shirts untucked. They left their shirts untucked. I was the only one who tucked my shirt in every single day uh, throughout a portion of elementary school. I'd go in and my friends would say, uh, Chris, why do you keep your shirt tucked in? And I would try to convince them. I'd be like, oh, you know, if, if you keep your shirt tucked in, you're going to look nice. And, you know, when you hang upside down on the monkey bars, your shirt's not going to fall over. <laughs> I tried to give them good reasons, but really the reason I wanted to tuck my shirt in is because that's what my dad did. My dad kept his shirt tucked in, stiff and formal. And he said to me, son, if you want people to respect you, you've got to keep your shirt tucked. You gotta keep it stiff. You gotta keep it formal. People are gonna think that you're uh, you don't take care of yourself if you've got a loose baggy shirt coming out. And whether my my dad was right or not, I wanted to be like him. <laughs> I wanted to look nice like my dad. I didn't want to look sloppy, and so I copied him throughout elementary school, even though no one else did. <laughs> my dad did so many things, and I wanted to do the same. Fathers. In the church, grandfathers, great grandfathers, your family will look up to you. You set the tone for your families. Whatever you do, they will do. However you act, they will act. If you use foul language in front of your sons or your daughters or your wives, God forbid, then they certainly too will use foul language. Men, we have been given by God the solemn responsibility to set the tone for our families. We must lead them well. On that final day when Christ returns, we will be held accountable for how we lead our families. Men, do you pray with your families? Do you read scripture with your family? Even you men who are older and your kids have left the house, do you pray with your wife? Do you read scripture with your wife? It literally takes us two minutes, two minutes to sit down and pray a prayer with our wives in the morning or in the evening, whenever you'd like to do it. Are you willing to take that two minutes? It's easy enough to open up your Bible to a psalm and read two or three verses and then literally two minutes praying with your wife. Every single man can do that, I promise you. No one can say they're too busy to spend two minutes praying with their wife. So the question is, do you do it? Will you do it? Will you lead your family of course, men, we have no direct commandment in Scripture to pray for at least two minutes, right? There's no command in Scripture. I'm not putting that burden on you. I'm not mentioning this example to say you must start praying for two minutes with your wives. But I am saying that we as men are required to lead our family well. So you must take action to lead your family well. I would suggest as a good place to start, two minutes of prayer. But if leading your family well, if God leads you and instructs you to do it differently, then brothers, do it differently. But do it. Lead your families well. Mothers, women in the church, we set an example for our families as well. Our kids look up to us. Our daughters copy us. Will you lead them as a good example in Christ? And finally, each and every one of us represents Christ on a daily basis as we walk around. People will look to you and they'll say, that's a Christian. That's what Christians look like. People who love Jesus, that's what they look like. Are we setting the example well? Are we leading others, showing them a picture of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ? So, Mount Carmel Baptist Church, let's set the example well. Let's men lead our families, and families, let's lead all those who look up to us as well. So we see that people followed after Peter. As he set the example. And finally, in the last verse, verse 14, we learn this, that Peter was corrected by Paul. Peter was corrected by Paul. In this last section, we see that the gospel is in authority over everyone, no matter what their title is or how important they seem to be in the church. Look at verse 14 with me. Paul says this, But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to see this before them all. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? I want to point out a couple things here real quick. Peter uh, was, was acting contrary to the gospel, and Paul was not afraid to call him out, even publicly, and correct 
his misstep with the gospel. We see that Peter got out of step with the gospel. I, I want to point out the two things that I think are real important here. Um, though Paul got, uh, though Peter got out of step with the gospel, Paul brought him back in with his loving but terse rebuke. <laughs> We see later evidence that Peter would come around, that he would repent, that he would join back with Paul in acting in accordance with the true gospel. Soon after this event in Antioch, all of the apostles would come together in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 15, we see that those people in Jerusalem uh, sent out a message to the church around the world saying, Gentiles need not be circumcised. All they have to do is be faithful to the Lord. Be faithful to the Lord. So Peter would come around and he would once again affirm the true gospel. Moreover, even later in Peter's life, he'd write letters to people in the church. And in those letters, he would commend Paul as a brother in Christ. But not only that, as an author of scriptures saying all that Paul writes are scriptures just like other scriptures. And you should listen to them, even if they can be difficult at some times to understand. So Peter was rebuked by Paul and Peter repented, came back acted in accordance with what he knew. God is gracious to us who step out of line. God was gracious to Peter, and if we, brothers, step out of line, God can be gracious to us as well. So, though Peter stepped out of line, God was gracious and brought him back. Second, we see that not even Peter was above the gospel. Peter was an apostle, but he was not just an apostle. He was a leader among the apostles. Appointed by Christ to a specific place, leading the church throughout that period where the apostles were on the earth. He was specifically chosen by God as a leader. But he made a mistake. Leaders make mistakes. Peter made a mistake. I want you to imagine a situation with me for just a minute. Imagine Charles Stanley. You all have heard of Charles Stanley before? Imagine Charles Stanley leaves the Atlanta area and comes up here to Kentucky to be the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Uh, and you and I are all sitting here one Sunday morning listening to Charles Stanley. And as he's preaching, Charles Stanley says something that doesn't sound quite right. That goes against what scripture teaches. Now, Charles Stanley is a wonderfully faithful pastor, and I doubt this would happen if he came to preach in our pulpit. But just, just humor me for a minute. Imagine if that were a possibility that Charles Stanley would say something that's not in accordance with Scripture or with our statement of faith, the Baptist faith and message. What should we do toward Charles Stanley, our pastor? What would we say? Would we say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's Charles Stanley, right? If he says it, then it must be true. We, we need to believe it. Or maybe we would say, even though I don't think that's right, this is Charles Stanley we're talking about. He, he's a great leader in the church, a great pastor. He has experience. I, I can't say anything to Charles Stanley about what he just said from the pulpit. I'll, I'll have to let someone else do that. He, he's a pastor. I can't, I can't correct him. Brothers and sisters, no one, no one is above the gospel. Peter was not above the gospel, and Peter was not above making mistakes. If Charles Stanley were to preach against the gospel or get out of step with the gospel, he's not above it. I am your pastor. I'm not above making mistakes. I'm not above the gospel. God's word keeps me in check just as it keeps you in check. So brothers and sisters... Read God's word and know God's word well and test everything you hear against God's word. I try very, very hard to be faithful to God's word. I study for hours every week. But even with all my study, I'm not perfect. And I make mistakes. And if I ever get out of step with the gospel, it is the whole church's responsibility to keep me accountable to God's word. If it's a choice between listening to me and listening to Scripture, brothers, listen to Scripture. Listen to Scripture. I hope you've heard this message before, and I, I hope as you're hearing it again, it affirms to you the authority and the, the beauty that Scripture has. It has authority over pastors. It has authority over apostles. It has authority over our lives. Brothers, when someone in our church, brothers and sisters, 
anyone, when someone in our church veers from the gospel in any major area of doctrine, it is our responsibility to act like Paul and go with them and bring them back in. Scripture outlines for us how to bring a brother back into the church. We first go personally, and then we go with a couple others, and then as a whole church, we go to them and bring them back in. But it is a responsibility that we have, and we must take that responsibility seriously. Whether that person is uh, the loved one sitting beside you, or, or the church member three rows back, or the pastor standing behind the pulpit, we have to keep them accountable to good doctrine and good faith. Now, I want to make an important point here. We as brothers and sisters in Christ need to give each other as much grace as we can in minor areas. Areas that, that are not major doctrines. Christ uh, has commanded to us to be unified. Paul has said, in Christ we are all one, so don't quibble about things that are not central to the gospel. There are many areas where we can disagree and still have wonderful unity, and God says, give each other grace in these areas. Like, like think about the end times, for example. Revelation is particularly difficult to interpret. And the best, most faithful believers read Revelation and sometimes disagree in how they think those end times are going to play out, don't we? But in those times, we give each other grace, knowing how difficult it is to read Revelation and to understand it well. But in central matters like the gospel, we have to keep each other accountable. We have a wonderful tool that helps us know when to call out our brothers, when to rebuke them, when to bring them back, and when... To give them grace and experience differences. It's our statement of faith. It's the Baptist faith and message. Our Baptist faith and message is a summary of what we believe the Bible teaches in the most important areas of the Christian life. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about Jesus? Jesus was born of a virgin, died and rose again, a bodily resurrection. If any brother or sister in our church starts to veer from our statement of faith, we must draw them back in, following those instructions in Scripture. But if we simply disagree on smaller matters, we give them grace, and we give them understanding. If you got lost in there, then my apologies. <laughs> All of that is me trying to say, brothers and sisters, no one's above the gospel. Everyone is underneath it, and it is our responsibility, just as Paul did, to keep each other accountable. If we start to veer away, if I, as your pastor, start to veer away, if you have a different pastor in the future, uh, Lord willing, 40 years from now, if you have a different pastor and he veers away from God's word and the gospel and from our statement of faith, hold him accountable. Keep him on track. Brothers and sisters, we must keep in step with the gospel. Personally, and then also, just as importantly, corporately, we together as a church must Keep each other in step with the gospel. The gospel is beautiful, and we want to keep in step with it. Let's pray together as we close. Oh Lord, your gospel message is wonderful and beautiful. We thank you, Lord, for your own majesty and glory and beauty, and that in your goodness, sending Christ to die for Oh, Lord, we have an initiative coming up. We are we're going to go out and share the gospel with people. Lord, please prepare people's hearts. Go out into our community, Lord. Send out your Holy Spirit. Draw people toward yourself. Get them ready. And, Lord, get us ready. Oh, Lord, get us so ready and so eager to share this good news with people. We can't help but, but jump out of our seats and run on the 29th to go share the gospel with people around us. Make us eager, Lord. Help us to become passionate and desperate for your help. Desperate for you to save souls around us. Lord, help us to be faithful to your gospel and keep in step with the gospel. Help us to hold each other accountable no matter who we are, whether highly respected or barely noticed. Lord, keep us all in step with the gospel. Oh Lord, we, we love you. And we want to be faithful to you. We ask that you keep us faithful and guard us. Guard our steps, guard our tongues, and our actions. Lord, we honor you this morning. And we pray that you'd help us continue to honor you with our actions and our words. 
It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. We have time for one more hymn. Let's sing it together. If you would like to respond to what you've heard this morning by repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus, then now is the time to do it.